So, I should say I'll post lecture notes or send them out. I just have to finish writing them um, later today. But so this talk is going to be on complex dynamics. But to start, um, the general idea with dynamics in general is that we have a topological space X. Space. And f is a map from x to x. Some map. Um, the idea is that oftentimes the forward iterates of f behave interestingly. So for the set of functions f, f composed with f, f composed with f, composed with f, composed with f, this sequence often behaves in kind of unexpected and bizarre ways that's interesting to study. So one thing I'll say off the bat, to make this easier, instead of writing f composed with this, I'm just going to write this as f squared, this is f cubed, and so on, to make things a little bit more notationally compact. Um, so for example, one question that might be interesting is that given a point x and x, we can look at the forward orbit right like this, which is just the set f of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, and so on. And the question you can ask, you know, questions about this, is this finite? If so, for when x is it finite, so you have interest like when it is Finite. Or you can also ask uh, when is a point periodic that is, say, um, when does there exist? Is equivalent? Yeah, these are equivalent. I'm just oh. kind of describing what this is. Um, or you could ask, also interestingly, when is x pre periodic? Which means you have x, you map to x1 under f, you map to x2 under f. At some point, you map to xn, but instead of coming all the way back to x1, you would cycle back somewhere into here. So instead of saying it's completely a period, it's that x maps eventually into some cycle. So you know, so f of m of x should equal f of n of x. Some So these are all examples of interesting questions in dynamics, and oftentimes the game is you choose the topological space you want, and you choose the type of map you want, and you can ask questions like this. Um, so for example, uh, if you wanted to, you could take x to be a finite field. Here the topology won't really matter, but there's an interesting algebraic structure you can ask, and you can take f to be some polynomial and ask which points are fixed under the polynomial. Um, and that answer could vary widely. For example, if you take f, this to be fp and this to be the polynomial, the pth power map, then of course everything is fixed by the pth power map. So the periodic set is the entire field. Um, but on the other hand, if you just take z to the p minus 1, the only fixed points are 0 and 1. So the only periodic sets are 0 and 1. So there can be a lot of variation. And this is often the game is to try to find interesting situations where you pick a nice space. You pick some set of maps and you ask these questions then. So, but as I said, our interest is going to be complex dynamics. 
So complex dynamics. has two settings, kind of. The first one is when we take x to be the complex numbers, and f is going to be some polynomial. Um, and the second one, which is kind of a generalization of this, is when x is the Riemann sphere, c union infinity, however you want to call it, all of these things. F is a holomorphic map. Further even sphere to itself. Um, yeah, so these are the two cases we're really going to be interested in complex dynamics. And in fact, we'll mostly focus on the case of holomorphic maps between the Riemann sphere because polynomials kind of can just fall out of that. If you just get rid of the point at infinity, you think about a polynomial. Being a map, uh, it, it is a holomorphic map. And one thing I want to note before moving on to the actual dynamics is that holomorphic maps between the Riemann sphere are actually quite nice, in particular if P1 P1 is holomorphic. of polynomials. So this will be... <laughs> Sorry, no, there's just some glare on the board, so I'm trying to okay. see if I can get these lights to turn on. I think it's these ones that dim them. Those ones look yeah. like they're turned on. Oh, no, 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 they're one of the buttons. Yeah. I think it's one of those. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. So this is going to be the situation we care about. Uh, So, let's see, oftentimes we need an eraser. Do you have an eraser? We're prepared. Got one. Um, so, many of you have probably seen pretty fractally pictures. You know, you've probably seen someone maybe on TV hold up a picture of the leaf and say, oh, look, it's fractally. It's, I zoom in and it looks the same always. Um, and oftentimes the pictures you see when they're not leaves or mountains or someone waxing poetically about nature are pictures of the Julia set. Something like these two things, which I'm not going to bother to fire up the projector for two seconds. But, and those things are Julia sets, and they're interesting dynamical objects in our setting. Um, but before we have to define them, can define them, we actually have to remember some complex analysis on, in particular, we have to remember that uh, let's see. if f curly f is a family of holomorphic functions. subset u to p1. And here it's kind of crucial we're going to p1 and not c or something else. Um, this definition wouldn't be quite right if the target wasn't compact. Um, so a family of holomorphic functions is normal
There exists. A open neighborhood. B about P and a subsequence. Functions. It's normal if every sequence in that thing, we can find the subsequence in an open neighborhood around every point where that subsequence will converge. Kind of a nasty, horrible definition that isn't fun to work with in the least. But it lets us define a Julia set. So, definition. If f from c hat to c hat is rational, Two set of F is the domain of normality of the family. Domain of normality of the family of forward iterates of f. We write this. It's denoted capital omega sub f. And the meaning <coughs> of this definition, we see it's open because the domain, I mean, domain, no, ah, domain of normality will itself be open. It's just all points, so that at that point we can find an open neighborhood around it. We're on that open neighborhood. This f will be normal on that neighborhood. This family will be normal. And from this we get the definition in Julia set. Necessarily be um, non empty. So the two sets, the two set of a rational map may be empty. In fact, there's a bunch of examples you can cook up called Latez examples due to Latez around 1918 or so, and which have empty or which have empty for two sets. So for example, f of z is the function z squared plus one all of that squared over four z. set of this will be the entire Riemann sphere. Um, and I won't go into showing this, it will be a citation in the notes. The idea is somehow this comes from a map on the torus, which we can then push down to a map on the Riemann sphere, and the number of periodic points in this will be dense, and for some reason that means the number of points in the uh, 
we know in the Julia set will be dense in P1, and since the Julia set will be closed, when we take its cl the closure of this subset we know will be dense, we get the whole thing, so the Julia set itself must be the whole thing. Um, so this has Julia set is enough, P1, the two set is empty. That said, it's a proposition that if the degree of a rational map is greater than or equal to 2, then J sub f can never be empty. Um, so while the two set may be empty, meaning the Julia hits the full Riemann sphere, the Julia set can't actually ever be empty, assuming the degree is greater than 1. And the idea behind this is the idea of the proof is if not, so if if this weren't true, if, if J sub f were empty, then the two sets would be the whole mean sphere. Which means the C meaning is normal at all of P1. Um, but then you can show that if this is the case, there's actually a subsequence which is going to have to converge to a whole more function on all of P1. And not just on a subset, but it has to converge on all of P1. Um, but the issue with that is we also can show the degrees of that sequence, the degree of this, yeah. Um, did, for that polynomial, you said that the periodic points were dense, and so, is, is that right? Um, the periodic points won't be dense. You, you said some set of points were dense, but then you like concluded that they were in the Julia set. Yeah, so. Um, I didn't understand how you made that. So the idea, which I won't go into, you can show there's just you can show kind of that this map co comes from a map on a torus. So you have a map up on a torus, which you can show has um, there's a set which is dense, and when you push this map down, you get that set is actually in the Julia set, um, and it's related to periodicity on the torus. But it's kind of Okay, so you didn't high. explain why, like, the points being no. periodic on the torus meant that they were in the Julia set. No. That's in fact, yeah, no, okay. I didn't explain that. But that is true. Um, yeah, so here, if we had, going back to this, if we had this family being normal in all of P1, we'd have subsequence S M sub K. Converging uniformly to a G holomorphic on all of P1. But the issue is, um, since this this map has degree greater than one, we know that each of these successive iterates has degree. So I thought earlier you said that the degree of f was defined to be the max of the degrees of the top and bottom. Yes. Right. So shouldn't this be degree four? This map here. Uh yeah. F. Mm -hmm. F. Of yes, that's four. But then doesn't the theorem say that that can't happen? No. The Julius set can't be empty. Oh. Okay. The two set can. I see what you're saying. So this is coming. Yeah. Out. The opposite. So this is saying that they're not quite. You have this fact for one and not for the other. Yes. So, um, so here we have a subsequence which converges to some holomorphic function on all of P one, but the degrees of these iterates are getting big. Each time you iterate, you can show that the degree of you know f squared will be the degree of your max squared, and so on, which kind of makes sense. You take a degree four two polynomial and you compose it. You get degree four, the degree eight, and so on, and so on. So the degrees of these subsequences is going to go to infinity. But you can also show that the degrees of this subsequence, if they're converging to this fg, have to 
go to the same thing. So G is somehow also having infinite degree, which gives us some contradiction. Um, this is kind of hand wavy because you actually have to go sh through and show that A, you have such a subsequence, and B, that these degrees are actually going to be the same. It's not entirely clear that it has to have the degree sequences converging. So, but if it did, you'd get this contradiction. And Why wouldn't this apply to degree one rational functions? Um, because if you, you, iter you iterate degree ones, you just get a degree one, right? Like you have um, a linear map and just keep composing it. Yeah. You're just kind of translating along the thing. And so I guess, I, although I guess I should maybe say one brief thing about people, degree one maps, and that is they are quite uninteresting. And that's why most of the theorems will say don't actually have exclude the trace of degree one, it's a fact. If f is degree one, then j sub f is either empty or j sub f is a single point. So either empty or a single point, there isn't much fun in studying it. Um, so most of our attention will be restricted to degree two. So, so, so far we know that the Julia set is closed, it's compact, the two sets open, and the Julia set of a degree two or greater map is never empty. Um, one other thing is both of these sets are entirely invariant. Position J sub f and mega sub f are completely invariant, which means f of the image of f of j under f would be the same as the initial Julia set, and the pre image of the Julia set would be the same. Same thing for the two sets. So, so, so in essence, they're stable under F. You can't map, you have to map things in the Julia set, have to map to things in the Julia set, or, and also come from other things in the Julia set, and vice versa for the two set. And this also tells us right away that the Julia set of f is also the same as the Julia set of many of the iterates of f. Which kind of makes sense because it's just some normal family. If we take one iterate, we don't change the family much. We just kind of shift down in our sequence. So these are some basic facts about the Julia set that are. Um, but intuitively, how we should think about it is the Fatou set is where things behave nicely. Right, that's where the function, this family of iterates is normal. It's where, at every point, I can find a function, a subsequence of my iterates, which will eventually converge holomorphically. So the idea is that the two set somehow is behaving nicely and is stable, whereas uh, the Julia set won't be stable, and that's where things get kind of weird. Um, and we can kind of see an example of that if we look at an example, which I think is the only. Two and Julia said, I know how to compute by hand. So if we look at the example, if f of z is just an map z squared, then our family of iterates, you know, this implies the nth iterate of z, this is just z to the 2 to the n. So the nth iterates have a nice closed formula. So we're interested in the family in particular f squared, sorry, z squared, z to the fourth, z to the two to the n, and so on. And we want to know when this family is normal. And a lucky guess would suggest that it's going to be normal everywhere except the unit circle. So our guess is that set is S1, so 
really sets the circle, and that the two set is everything outside the circle. And it turns out this is the case. And the reason why is if I take a point outside the unit circle, here, um, since it's open, I can take a little ball that's also outside the unit circle. And here, all of these points have absolute value greater than 1. And so if I iterate them under this map, this map takes things that have modules greater than 1, they go towards infinity, because everything, if you take it to really high powers, gets really big. So this, in this little neighborhood, everything at high enough powers will be looking like infinity. So here, um, our f to the n's converge to the constant function infinity. Similarly, if we take a point inside the circle, we can take an open neighborhood here, and this is smaller than one, so we take really big powers, it goes to zero. So this point inside, the functions will converge uniformly to the constant function zero. So we know that the Julia set, or sorry, we know that the two set contains at least everything outside at least these two things, are at least P1 minus S1. Um, to show that it can't be more, you know, if we take something on the circle and take an open neighborhood, it's going to have things both inside and outside the circle. But we know things inside the circle are going to converge towards zero. Things outside the circle converge towards infinity. And so you have a really big jump discontinuity. You have from zero to infinity, you have to jump to make it discontinuous, and that can't happen. So somehow when we cross this boundary, it forces our function to have this discontinuity. And that's kind of the notion of why this point is unstable, because when you can't puff it up any, you have this, you're really restricted to anything here will contain something that does one thing and something that really wants to do something else, forcing it to have a discontinuity. So this is the so this is actually correct. This is kind of a hand wavy reason. This is, can be all made be rigorous if you really want to have fun with an analysis, which I don't. Um, but I don't know how to do this for any other really good examples. I mean, maybe, okay, I'll replace this two with a four, and I can do it for z to the fourth or things like that. But like, even if you gave me z to the z squared plus two, or no, z squared plus some c it would probably be really hard for me to figure this out. And if you've seen pictures of these things, you'd probably guess that it, they're hard to figure out by hand. Um, guessing. So we kind of want a better way to figure out what the Julia sets are, and that will be the motivating question. Is Can we find a definition where I don't have to spend time talking about normal families because I don't like normal families. They're kind of confusing hard, and hard to work with. And also, I don't know how I would ask a computer to make a picture of a normal family. It, I don't know how I'd ask, okay, take a point, tell me if it's, this point is normal here. I don't think a function, a computer could tell you if it's converging to a whole of the function. Or not. So that's going to be kind of the goal for the rest of the talk, is to figure out a better characterization of the Julia set and the two set. To do this, we have to kind of shift gears and go to something Matt kind of mentioned a little bit ago, which is periodic cycles. So. A cycle, so Z naught in P1 is periodic. Um, if F to the N of Z naught equals Z naught, and has period N. If you have a two cycle, you can also think about it as a four cycle because two cycles are fixed, so the fourth iterate will also fix the second iterate, and so that's fixed. But we don't want to think about a two cycle as a four cycle. We just want to think about it as a two cycle. So the period is the smallest number for which it wraps back onto itself. So then we define what we call the multiplier, which is just So 
the multiplier of an n cycle is just lambda, which is take the nth iterate, take the derivative of the nth iterate, evaluate it at z naught, where z naught is a point is in the n cycle. So this definition seems to depend on the choice of z naught, but it doesn't because chain rule is awesome. And if we take the nth derivative, this is the same thing as taking the derivative of uh, it's the chain rule. <laughs> <laughs> it works out, and you can show that this is not going to depend on the choice because this derivative actually has each deriv the derivative of f at each point encoded into it. So this is well defined, and then we say, so if the absolute value of lambda is less than one, then we say this is attracting, it's like it's attracting. If the absolute value of lambda is greater than one, we say it's repelling. And if the absolute value of lambda is equal to 1, we say this is indifferent. So we classify cycles as by their multiplier, and there's three types, attracting, repelling, indifferent. And as the names for these two suggest, we do this because this multiplier tells us what's locally going on. So if we think about a fixed point, we're just looking at the derivative around a fixed point, we're looking at the derivative of f, and that's going to tell us locally the behavior of f. And if the derivative of f is really small, then points should be kind of attracted to that fixed point locally in some small neighborhood. And you can make this rigorous looking at Taylor series and whatnot, where if the derivative is bigger than 1, you take a little point near it, they should be getting larger and kind of going away from that fixed point. The indifferent case is complicated and has a bunch of subcases and is not completely well understood, even now. There are a lot of questions about this. So we'll really not focus much on the indifferent case. It's in Milner's book, um, and I might touch on it in the notes I'll post, but we'll really ignore this. So the two things we're really interested in is attracting and repelling cycles. And the first thing we want to note is where each of these live. And it turns out that if z naught is in an attracting cycle, attracting cycle, and then the point. two set and conversely repelling points repelling cycle then z naught is in the G set. And in the indifferent case, sometimes in one, sometimes in the other, not quite sure what's going on. Really don't know. I'm not actually going to prove these, it will be proved in the notes. The general idea is that if the synthesis is attracting, we know we're going to have some bound on how our function behaves. And in particular, we can use Taylor's theorem to show that we can bound the difference locally from z naught from our function by c times the absolute value of those points. And so when you iterate, this means this is actually going to converge to the function z naught, the constant function z naught locally. Which makes sense if you kind of have a small derivative. Locally, you should look like the constant function z naught. Um, here, the idea is that if we had something that was in the Fatou set, it would be normal, so you could find an open neighborhood around it where it was normal. But then we'd have some sequence of these things converging. But Balanza Weierstrass would tell us that sorry, not Balanza Weierstrass, but Weierstrass uniform convergence would tell us the partial derivatives of our sequence also converge to the partial deri er, derivatives of our thing we're looking at. 
But the derivatives are these lambda things, and they're getting big because lambda is greater than one, and when you iterate it, you can show that lambda will be getting big under iteration. So you have somehow have a sequence converging to a holomorphic function whose derivatives are unbounded at a point which can't happen. So that's for roughly the idea. The, the exact proof will be sketched, will actually be in the notes, but it's really just kind of coming down to, in the first case, Taylor's theorem, and in the second case, Weierstrass uniform convergence. So now we know that where these live, and this kind of helps us describing the two, the two in Julia set in particular, this gives us the great corollary that the set of points in repelling cycles if we close this up this is the Julia set just because this is closed. But again not super helpful definition because closures are not all that well behaved sometimes. Or at least not easy to implement computationally. Luckily we have this kind of weird looking but amazing theorem that I'll tell you right now which will make everything nice and give us the desired result. It also somehow shows why the Julia set is kind of chaotic. So some neighborhood around it. Any neighborhood, no matter how small, will eventually encompass the whole Julia set. But moreover, the set P1 without the orbit of this U is cardinality less than or equal to 2. So take some small neighborhood, map it up under F. It hits everything, maybe except two points. So you can start with, you know, some, in the case of the circle, right, that means take some small, small ball here, and I can hit almost everything on the complex plane in infinity, maybe with the exception of two points. This will be proved in the notes. The idea is we prove this first fact, which essentially comes down to a corollary of Montel's theorem, because if we were to miss more than two points, you'd miss three points, and you can, Montel's theorem tells us families missing three points are normal which would give us something like this. And then you do some counting arguments and show that this set is actually invariant under inverse images to get that the points in this set actually have to be critical. And so um, they have to be super attracting, which means they're in the two set, not in the Julia set, which gives us the first inequality. I should say, I guess I didn't mention this, if the multiplier happens to be zero, we say it's super attracting. Um, it's just a definition. So with this in hand, we get, we're finally getting to some cool actual corollaries and descriptions of the Julia set. In particular, the first corollary we get almost immediately is the Julia set if the interior of J sub F is not equal, is not empty, then J 
okay, so that is the entire means here. Because if you had, it was, if it, the interior was not empty, you could take an open neighborhood in the interior and map it forward, take that to be our U in the theorem, so we know it hits almost everything. So its closure is P1. But we also know things in the Julius set are invariant under F. So since we took this open neighborhood to be entirely inside of J sub F, all of its four iterates are entirely inside of J sub F. So it's actually, this orbit would actually be inside of J sub F. And so its closure is the whole thing. But its closure is P1 because we have only missed two points. And then the really cool corollary is that if A is a basin of attraction, Attracting cycle and then the boundary of A is the Julius set of F. And the basin of attraction is exactly what you might guess it is, namely it's the open set consisting of all points in P1, such that if we map them forward under F, we'll eventually converge into this attracting cycle. So the attracting cycle we said should locally attract points, and we'll define the basin of attraction to be the things that do attract, the set of points which do get attracted to the cycle. Um, and this is great, because this is now something you can actually ask a computer to do, right? So you find some end cycle, you know it, figure out it's attracting, and then you tell the computer, hey, take a point, map it under F a bunch of times, tell me if it gets close to any of these points in my list. If it does, color it one color. If it doesn't, color it the other color. And the boundary between the two colors will exactly give you the Julia set. So this is how it's done. So you might have seen previously uh, someone describe the Julia set of a polynomial. Uh, you might have seen someone say something like this. Z in C such that the absolute value of f to the n is not is less than infinity for all n. Right? Someone might have described the Julia set of a polynomial being <clears throat> the set of things which are bounded under four iteration. And that's exactly right, because the basin of attract this is just the attracting basin of infinity. So you have a polynomial, and a polynomial evaluates infinity at infinity, thinking about it as a map on sphere, so it has a fixed point at infinity. And in fact, being a little bit careful, you can show that the multiplier of infinity is zero. So infinity is a super attracting fixed point of every polynomial. So this corollary tells us the Julia set is the boundary of this basin of the super attracting fixed point at infinity. Which, how do we find that? We just take points, map them iter iteratively under F, and say, do they go to infinity? If yes, color them blue. If not, color them black. And then the difference between the two will be the Julius set. So this is, might be the definition you've seen before. Should that be basin of attraction of an attracting cycle or of all attracting cycles? Of an. Okay, so you can just pick any one yeah, and you can pick any the same set? Yes, which is kind of a cool fact yeah. in amongst itself. Um, so one last thing I'll say is This seems great, but there is one thing I'm covering up when we haven't talked about it, which is I need to have an attracting cycle. And I don't know how to find an attracting cycle. Like, right? We don't even know they exist. It's like, given a map, you can't really give you a good criteria to have some iterate map into itself with multiplier plus than one. So finding these is kind of difficult. You might think you have to kind of somehow have some search algorithm. But Second awesome theorem of the talk is the following one due to I believe the two, which is theorem if f p one p one is rational. So it's not a silly example. 
and z0, z1, z2, zn, which is z0. So if this is a attracting end cycle, cycle, then there exists a critical point P and P1 of F such that the sequence P F to the N of P F to the 2N of P so on contains one of the zi. So there's a critical point such as forward orbit on the nth iterates of this contain one of these points in our cycle. So in particular, a critical point is in the basin of attraction of this map of this cycle and maps into it. So we now know how to find them, because if we want to find an attracting cycle, we just find the critical points, map them forward, and see if they eventually cycle. If there are attracting cycles, this theorem tells us one of the critical points will eventually hit it. And so we're done. As an awesome corollary of this is, we actually need to bound on the number of attracting cycles. Because this tells us that critical points go into the attracting cycles under iteration, so there are no more attracting cycles than there are critical points. But Riemann Hurwitz tells us how many critical points a rational map can have. In particular, if the degree of f is d, then f has no more Two D minus two attracting cycles. So there are actually finite in many of them, no more than twice the degree minus two, and we can find and each of these critical uh, attracting cycles can be found by looking at the critical points, which are things we can actually find. So you just take the derivatives, see where they vanish. It's easy to find critical points, and then we can find these cycles. So. This now actually shows how we actually have a legitimate way to find this dual set. It's the, base, the boundary of the basin of attraction. Well, how do we find the basin of attraction? We look for critical points and find which ones might go into periodic or periodic attracting cycles. And as a note, I'll say we're looking at rational maps of degree d. 2d minus 2 happens to be the dimension of the moduli space of degree D rational maps up to automorphism of P1. It's just kind of weird that somehow the number of cycles is also bounded by the dimension of that moduli space that we're like study. So that's how we can find these. And now pretty pictures, because I promise pretty pictures if this turns on. I guess I should probably ask if there's any questions before I waiting this for. So here are the two examples I pointed out at the beginning. These are both Julia sets of various polynomials. This is a rational map, or sorry, this is a polynomial. I want to say z times z plus i, maybe. I can look that up if you're interested. This is the rational map. Minus one over three z squared, which does anyone know where that comes from? Without me giving away what I'm looking at, 
So this is the rational map for you to look at when you iterate Newton's method, right? You want to find zeros of a polynomial. You look at this rational function, you pick a point, and you iterate, and you hope you get zero. And this is the Julia set of that. So we exactly took this rational map, we take a point, we iterate it, and we're coloring depending on where it's going. And you can see, if we look at the orbits, there are three fixed points, one for each color, which is what we expect because this has three, fi three fixed points and consider it on the complex plane. But the interesting thing is if we look here, we see that there's a bunch of different colors and they kind of spire randomly. And this tells us, shows us that you know Newton's method really is uh, sensitive to initial conditions because if I pick, for example, a point here, I'm now in the blue thing, but if I move a bit, I'm jumping to the red one. Similar here, I'm in the red one, There we go, now I'm in the green one. So just clicking around it a tiny bit. And these are pretty small changes. So like 0.5 or so off. So you can see Newton's method, as you might have found out in calculus, was really a pain in the ass to use. Other examples? Polynomial Julius sets, this is the cauliflower. This has this is an in, in, indifferent fixed point right here. So you can see this one is actually in the two set, I think. Here is another one. This is z times z plus i, so I was wrong before. This has a four cycle, marked with the white dots. And this one is pretty common, it's called the cauliflower z times z plus one. Here's some more. This is called the dendrite because it looks like a dendrite, I guess. And this is called the rabbit. I don't know why. <laughs> it's named for Duity. Or sorry, Duity and Hubbard, I think. One of whom was here this fall. Both of those are also polynomials. So you see, I couldn't have guessed that if I had to go by hand how to show this as normal. I actually don't know how to do it. That's Facebook. Airplane, I guess it looks like an airplane. Now here are some rational map ones. So this is a rational. These are rational maps. You can see this is a little bit more complicated than all the polynomial ones even. Um, here are two more rational maps. This one, the Fatou set is actually dense here. So there's a bunch of the two sets, and it's everywhere. This one uh, is the Julie set for some rational map, and the interesting thing is it's made of uncountably many circles, all of whom are disjoint. Uh, <coughs> that's interesting. I'll say one last thing real fast, <coughs> which is when we look at this example here on the right, this one, there's kind of three colors going on, blue, black and red, and the reason that it is is because if you look at it with only one color, you lose a lot of detail, and how this is colored is, this is actually the map, some number times this, z squared times z minus 4 over this, and this does have a super attracting fixed point at infinity, so we color that part blue, and if, points, if we take a point, if it seems to be going to infinity, we color it blue, but it also has can show a super tracking fix point at 4. And so we also color the things which are going towards 4. We color those red, and the black things are the other things that do things differently. And the reason we do that is because it gives us more detail. So we're actually looking at kind of two different basins of attraction, and the boundary gives us a little more minor detail. What about like, like you know, the gradient of color? What is that? In this one, on the right? Well, I, also in the left one, like in, in the very center, there's like the red, and then like it's kind of darker. Oh, so that's just a, an artifact of the computing. Oh, okay. how it does. So 
you can actually see these kind of curves here, kind of going throughout uh -huh. these pictures, and those are level curves. It's how this does it, I believe, fractal. This is made with a program called Fractal Stream. I think how it does it is instead of iterating forward, I think it looks at approximating pre-images. And so you can see these pre-images are just level curves. And somehow how it colors, it gets kind of dark and weird. Um, is it like a measure of how fast they're attra attracting or being repelled from the colors? Point? Or um, could it be interpreted that way? Or? I don't think so. So like this, these pictures here, I just let Fractal Steam do an auto coloring, which I don't know how it picks it. It just picks them to make the picture seem fairly visible, I think. Um, I'm sure someone who knows more about how Fractal Steam actually does this can tell you what the coloring exactly is. But you could also make it color however you want. So you could tell Fractal Stream to color it, I think, depending on how it acts. But I don't think it's I mean, how. Maybe it like one band of color into the next band. Yeah, so I mean, generation. let's see. How sensitive is this to those choices of constants? Like, if you replaced that by minus 1.755, would you expect to see something totally different, or...? Um, let's find out. In general, it's a pain in the ass. Okay. C squared. Let's see. Minus... 1.755. So, maybe minus 1.7 will try to start, right? So I'm just telling Fractal Steam to iterate this until the Z's go to infinity. Now it's angry. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. So it still looks kind of the same, but it's still yeah. somewhat different. You're seeing this to be one dimensional. So a similar shape, but a lot narrower. Yeah, so something I'll mention briefly. So we're, these were, most of these are examples of things in the form z squared plus c. So this is Something I'll talk about maybe next talk or the one after this is the Mandelbrot set where we're plotting values of c here. The black ones have bounded for an orbit of 0 0.0. And in each one of these regions, it turns out the Julia sets will look normally roughly the same in some sense. Yeah, so here's a circle, right? I just click somewhere in the main ball. But if I pick somewhere else in the main ball, it's still, it looks kind of different, right? But it's still one kind of contiguous piece, and it seems to be deforming, just deform. Whereas if we go, like into this ball, we get this kind of puffed up airplane, right? We're still seeing essentially the airplane shape, right? Center ball, two things up here, kind of tail fin, I guess. Right? So they look kind of different, but they have somehow a very similar shape still. So, within each of these balls, they'll kind of vary <clears> this. <throat> so, it's sensitive to initial condition if you want something precise. If you want to have similar things, there's statements saying they'll be similar and close to.